We would now like to begin Nikkei Forum, India-Japan Special Strategic and Global Partnership Priorities in the Evolving Global Order, interaction with Dr. Ajay Shankar, External Affairs Minister of India. This would be conducted on a hybrid format on-site as well as streaming in English. Today's moderator is from Nikkei, Editor-in-Chief Toru Takahashi. Mr. Takahashi, the floor is yours. I will be the moderator for today's session. My name is Takahashi from Nikkei. Now today's speaker, Dr. Sparanyam Jaishankar, India's Minister of External Affairs. Dr. Jai Shankar was born in New Delhi in 1955. He is a graduate of the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru University, where he earned a PhD in international relations. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1977, and he has worked in embassies in Moscow and Tokyo. Also, he has served as India's ambassador to China and the United States, to name a few. The doctor was appointed as foreign secretary in 2015 and served till 2018 after which work for a short while at the Tata Group, India's largest conglomerate. And he was appointed Minister of External Affairs by Prime Minister Modi in 2019. He's the author of two books, The India Way, Strategies for an Uncertain World, and Why Bharat Matters, which was released earlier this year. Last year, India overtook China as the most populous nation in the world. Also in 2023, India assumed presidency of the G20. As a voice representing the global south, India's growing presence in the global arena is clear for all to see. It is now time to hear the minister's view on the challenges that we face in an increasing and turbulent world and the interaction with Japan. So Dr. Jashanka, the floor is yours. Please welcome the minister with a big round of applause. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, and uh, let me say that I'm delighted to join you all at the Nikkei Forum to discuss the India-Japan partnership in the context of the evolving glo global order. As you're all aware, uh, or at least as some of you would be aware, I've written two books that certainly discuss the changing order while also flagging the relevance of India-Japan ties. Uh, that, of course, underlines my deep conviction on this subject. It also reflects the long association I've had with this relationship and the witness I bear to its transformation in the last two decades. In my first book, The India Way, I spoke of the future posture of Japan as a big imponderable because it will bring back into the global security calculus a major economy with enormous technological capabilities. In the four years that have passed since that first book was published, I'm even more convinced of this belief. We are transitioning into a world of AI and chips, of electric mobility and batteries, of clean and green tech, of space and drones, and indeed, much else that awaits us. There is a mirror image of this assessment that pertains to India with its enormous pool of talent. On my current visit, realizing this complementarity has actually been one of the focal points of my discussion. Another point which I make in my first book is actually the historical basis for our relationship, some of which is perhaps a little unfamiliar to the current generation. What is important is that for us, history is a positive force in our relationship, something perhaps that cannot always be said in Asia. 
Keeping that in mind, I focused on the maritime aspects of that collaboration. A reason for doing so was that in 2019-2020, the debate about the, that's when my first book came out, uh, the debate about the Indo-Pacific was still very hot, just as the jury was out on the court. Since then, both have settled down, finding wider acceptance even beyond the region. The maritime issue was particularly important because it was the truest example of the global commons challenge that was emerging at that time. Again, since then, it is even more so because of a lot of changes that we expect uh, to see in terms of new maritime balances. A related issue that I flagged earlier was that of connectivity. India was the first country to display strategic clarity in regard to contemporary initiatives. We publicly urged that connectivity endeavors must be collaborative, be transparent, be viable, and be respectful of sovereignty. Frankly speaking, most of the world wobbled in this regard at that moment. Time and experience has brought them around, but not without a cost. In my second book, Why Bharat Matters, I have approached the Japan relationship more explicitly from the perspective of the Quad. One question that has intrigued many observers is why the Quad failed in 2007 but succeeded in 2017 and thereafter. The answer, of course, is that in 2007, none of the parties was willing to invest the necessary capital, the political capital, uh, and, uh, to make that happen. And they would not, because uh, with the possible exception of a few voices in Japan, none of them actually had a good reading of how developments in the Indo-Pacific would unfold over the next decade. In 2017, we were clearly much wiser as a result of intervening events. But even this is not a full answer in itself. The fact is that of the Quad members, two of them have treaty relationships with the third. India, in many ways, is an outlier. But my case is that between 2007 and 2017, India's bilateral relationship with the United States, with Japan, with Australia, has changed so drastically that a quad arrangement has become both viable and sustainable. I have compared these three bilateral relationships in my book, and you can see that while there is a parallel time frame for improvement uh, between, uh, the, between India's ties with US and Japan, the Australian one has really played a remarkable catch up in the last decade. Having said that, I would strongly caution uh, that there is no room for complacency in diplomacy. Relationships need to be continuously tended at various levels. They also need to be constantly refreshed. There will always be new complexities, but equally fresh opportunities. This is how India and Japan should approach each other today. Overall, and I say this after a long discussion yesterday with my counterpart, Minister Kamikawa, we are convergent on the big picture and the key concerns. Our inclination and ability to respond in a more coordinated manner has also improved. We can, for example, see that in defense, where a bilateral military exercise is going on between India and Japan, even as we speak. It is much better in investment, though trade remains flatter than we would wish. India and Japan are also having an active conversation on emerging technologies that hold much promise. Creating new supply chains and building a stronger digital connect are priorities for both of us. 
We work well together in world politics, including of late in the multilateral organizations. People to people linkages, however, lag behind and clearly need more attention. This is the report card right now. My argument is that India-Japan ties will both draw strength from our larger activities together, especially from the Quad, but as well contribute to its effectiveness and to its breadth. The bottom line is that the world is changing, the Indo-Pacific is changing, India and Japan are changing, but that in our relationship, many solutions for us nationally as well as for the region and for the world uh, are lie there. So once again, I thank you all for joining uh, me today and I look forward to the conversation. Uh, thank you, Excellency. Thank you so much in terms of relationship between Japan and India and the surrounding circumstances. You have provided us with a very uh, insightful, uh, provoking speech. So I'd like to now move on to the talking session. So the talk session from here. So I would like to uh, ask question, if I may to His Excellency. And then, if time allows, I would like to welcome questions from the floor as well. So, thank you very much. So, uh, Minister, Doctor, the speech that you have provided uh, to us, uh, you talked about the fact that no room for complacency in diplomacy. It always need to make improvement. That really sticked into my mind. And relative to that, in terms of the strategic autonomy, the uh, under the Indian uh, diplomacy policy. I would like to, of course, ask that, of course, you uh, center the value of the nation and then you are flexible, placing importance in national interests. But the presence of India is becoming more important in this region. And in the international uh, benefit, you may, may be asked to act on the interest of the international community rather than your own interest. What do you think about this balance? Um. You know, I think uh, in diplomacy, uh, it is uh, possible to act in your own interest, in good diplomacy, uh, act in your own interest, but also in the interest of the international community. I don't think there are two choices that you have to make, if you know how to reconcile those choices. Uh, you spoke about strategic autonomy. Uh, in a way, for uh, many countries, strategic autonomy means having a very independent position where you decide, uh, uh, make your choices, your judgments on the basis of the merits, merits of the issue. But today, strategic judge, uh, autonomy, especially after COVID, has come to acquire also a very a bigger meaning. Uh, for many countries, that means having in your control or your influence, some very basic, uh, basic, you know, issues which relate to your national well-being. So, health security, food security, energy security, they have all become part of the uh, effort towards strategic autonomy. So, it is not just a, a very narrow foreign policy debate anymore. I, th I think uh, there are economic issues involved, there are development issues involved, there are technology issues involved. I mean, um, today countries would not like to be dependent uh, on somebody else, uh, particularly if it's a single source, uh, for, uh, for our technology requirements. They may even have concerns about the kind of technology which are coming from there. So, uh, so I, my sense is today the world is moving towards uh, uh, towards uh, many more players who are, who are trying to uh, advance their interest but also reconcile it with the rest of the world. And when you speak about where uh, India is, yes, you know, our, our uh, economic size is increasing, our political influence is increasing, uh, in technology areas our capabilities are growing. Uh, but I also believe India speaks for a lot of countries in the world. that. Uh, today, if there are 125 countries of the global south, 
uh, I would say in many ways in the, what India says reflects the, the collective belief uh, of, of many of these countries. So we feel on the whole we articulate positions which are both for the good of the world and for the good of India. Well, relative to that, in terms of relationship with Russia, uh, India, uh, the, in terms of uh, the border uh, conflict uh, with Russia, uh, you have been talked about the importance of the territorial uh, integrity and uh, sovereignty, but uh, you have not uh, come out in terms of criticizing uh, Russia aggression to Ukraine. And people may think that this is double standard. So what would be your position on this comment? You know, uh, my position would be uh, that the world uh, is a complicated place and there are many important uh, principles and beliefs in the world. Uh, what happens sometimes in politics, in world politics, is countries pick one issue, one situation, uh, one principle, and they highlight it because it suits them. But if one uh, looks at, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the principle itself, I mean, we in India know better than almost any other country uh, because immediately after our independence, uh, we experienced uh, aggression. Uh, we experienced an effort to change our boundaries. And even today, parts of India are occupied by another country. But we did not see the world uh, respond saying, oh, there's a great principle involved and therefore let us all go with India. So yes, today we are being uh, told that there are principles involved. I wish I'd seen that principle in play for the last 80 years. I've seen those principles cherry picked when it suits people and not when it doesn't suit people. But, but I do think it's an important principle, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, 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 I would say injustice was done to us. I'm not advocating it should be done to everybody else. We are, uh, you know, we have been very clear. My prime minister has stood next to President Putin and has said that we do not believe that this is an era of war. We are today for resolving this conflict. We want to see the end to this conflict. But we believe that every conflict finally ends in some kind of, you know, people come to the table. That's how conflicts end. I mean, you can also decide a conflict on the battlefield, but we don't think this conflict will be decided on the battlefield. So in what you have said, the global south, 125 country you mentioned. So in terms of global south, this concept, I would like to hear your opinion, uh, Minister. India last year was a presidency of a G20 meeting, and within that, well, the globe, you also have organized a voice of the global summit. And in terms of G7 have said global summit, it's a little sounding too high-handed. We try to avoid this word. And uh, in Japan, we use the word global summit quite ex uh, frequently. But the gap, how do you reckon this gap that we see regarding the notion of global sum uh, south? Uh, sorry, which word do you try to avoid? Uh, uh, global summit. The word global south, we try to avoid them. Um, because I, I see a lot of countries who are not part of the global south, uh, not always uh, comfortable with the word global south. Uh, so that itself is worth thinking about. Now, um, what is the global south? To me, global south would be collection of countries, uh, roughly 125, I'm giving you a number. Uh, who would have gone through, uh, you know, the colonial experience, have become independent after that, uh, who in their history have seen the, the, uh, the damage, the, the enormous uh, uh, sort of uh, injustice done to them, who are still in a developing mode. So there is a, there is a broad I would say income category, these would really be relatively low income uh, countries uh, and uh, who have a certain sense of solidarity which comes both from shared, uh, shared history, shared politics as well as from shared economic development issues. So on a lot of issues, 
these countries actually feel for each other. They come for each other. They, if you uh, are in a situation, uh, you know, you're all in the room. The countries of the global south will know. I mean, if there are 200 countries in the room, we would know, okay, which one of us has been through this and we, uh, we have that uh, bonding which comes from it. Uh, that feeling has been intensified uh, by COVID uh, because by and large, uh, many countries of the global south, uh, they, were, uh, they felt that they were the last uh, in the line to get the vaccine, uh, that many of their uh, concerns, uh, concerns about debt, uh, concerns about trade, concerns about uh, inflation, uh, these were not recognized by, uh, uh, by the major powers in the world. Uh, even they felt uh, even up to the time when India became G20 president that their concerns were not even on the agenda of the G20. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they have a strong uh, feeling about, about this. So uh, we, we did last year two meetings of the Voice of the Global South because we wanted to listen to these 125 countries and then put before the G20 a set of issues uh, which we said are the collective views of these 125 countries. Uh, and uh, therefore, I can tell you, uh, <clears throat> as, a, as a foreign minister who travels a lot to within Asia, to Africa, to Asia, in those continents, Global South is very popular. In those continents, they know exactly what is happening, who is speaking up for them, uh, how their issues are getting on the table. You know, they, 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 they don't think it is a coincidence that it was under the Indian presidency that Africa, African Union, which had long been promised a seat in the G20, finally got a seat. So the Global South believes us. Thank you very much. At the summit, 125 countries have participated. China was not part of it. So is China part of the Global South or not? What are your thoughts, doctor? Uh, at the uh, two summits uh, which we convened, I don't believe China was present. Hi. Hey. Hey. I'm a simple now, but I'm very simple answer. Excellent, doctor. And I do have another question. IEA, about the negotiation to join IEA, the International Energy Agency. So IEA has announced that uh, they would officially engage in the negotiation with India. So last year in October, you have applied for uh, in the, uh, the membership into IEA. What is the reason behind that? Also, the second point, in principle, participation in the IEA is conditional on membership in the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Is India also interested in joining the OECD? On the uh, International Energy Agency, I think uh, uh, the reason why we uh, applied to join uh, was that uh, today India is becoming a very important energy player. Uh, one in the sense of our consumption. Uh, uh, so as you know, we are today the fifth largest economy and that is reflected uh, in the consumption. Two, because we import the overwhelming uh, proportion of our energy. So in the energy trade uh, also uh, we have we have a, uh, a very big uh, role. Uh, three, uh, we uh, there are best practices in in this field. Uh, we have also uh, started to acquire uh, energy assets outside production assets outside India. Uh, that is happening more and more. It has happened in uh, Asia. It is now happening in Latin Amer in Africa in Latin America. And uh, we are uh, also building up strategic reserves like Japan did many, many years ago. So if you look at the totality of all of this, it makes sense that we would uh, benefit from a membership of IEA and IEA would in turn uh, be, uh, would find India joining it uh, to be of advantage. 
uh, obviously uh, you know there are uh, some uh, some things which are very uh, specific to india uh, so uh, the iea membership knows that so that is under discussion uh, but we are quite uh, quite uh, confident that they will take a positive look uh, on the issue of oecd uh, uh, quite honestly i don't at this point you know uh, at this time there's really no answer i can give you uh, but i do note that uh, indonesia i believe has uh, applied for uh, membership so i do note that but i really cannot you know speak of any uh, position or even thinking uh, that india uh, has on this matter because it has not matured uh, to that point Thank you very much for that. Now I'd like to ask the floor uh, to pose any questions. So those who have any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, please, this person in the middle, please. We will bring the microphone to you. Please hold. My name is Sonobe. Uh, I'm the dean of the ADB's think tank called ADBI. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much for the very insightful uh, remarks. Uh, but uh, your talk uh, mostly about the bilateral relationship. But how about the multilateral relationships? Uh, for example, both uh, India and Japan could have played more important roles in the United Nations if they were given the kind of seats or positions that they deserve. Uh, so uh, could you uh, please uh, share your thoughts about uh, uh, this and the other aspects of uh, any aspect of multilateralism? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned it in passing because it was also something yesterday I discussed in some detail with uh, uh, Minister Kamikawa. Uh, you know, most of us actually understand that there is a great need to reform the United Nations. Uh, it's a common sense, uh, 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 I would say, conclusion, because uh, when the United Nations was founded, uh, there were roughly about 50 countries who were members. Today, there, there are almost 200 countries who are members. So. In any organization, if the membership has grown four times, uh, the, the leadership and the decision making of that organization cannot remain the same. Uh, and uh, we are seeing today uh, the problem uh, when there is uh, inadequate change. Uh, so, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, if you look today at many of the key key issues in the world, the UN is not playing the role which the UN should be playing. Now, it's not like there has never been change. There has been change. The Security Council has been expanded once to bring in uh, more non-permanent uh, members. Uh, so, uh, we know change will come. We know there will be a change in the Security Council. The real issue is when does it come? How long does it take? And what will what form will it take? Now, again, even if you look at what form will it take, I think some parts of it are quite obvious. Uh, there is not a single uh, African member. There is not a single uh, Latin American member. I mean, Africa is a continent of more than 50 nations, but there's no member. So, and uh, I mean, in the case of uh, uh, Asia, uh, yes, there is one member, but if you look today at the uh, dynamism of Asia, the demographics of Asia, uh, the, the, you know, the size of nations. I think there's a very, very uh, strong uh, case uh, as well. Uh, so uh, these discussions are going on. Uh, uh, we felt that, you know, in many ways, uh, the discussions have not progressed because those who are opposed to any change have found ways of delaying it. But we have now reached a stage where uh, uh, actually 
uh, different countries and groups are presenting. There is a process called the Intergovernmental Negotiation, IGN process. Uh, the process is currently chaired by Kuwait and Austria. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they are today being presented with different models of, you know, uh, uh, of how such a change can happen. Uh, so uh, the developing countries, the Global South has presented its model. Uh, it's a group called L69 there. Uh, Mexico has presented its model. Uh, on behalf of small countries, Liechtenstein has presented its model. Uh, I think uh, G4, that is India, Japan, Germany, and Brazil, we will be presenting our model as well. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be an African presentation. There may be some, some other regions. Uh, so it is a process which is moving. We believe that process cannot be stopped. It can be delayed. But in the good of the world, the sooner it happens, uh, the, the uh, better uh, it would be. Uh, you know, if the most populous countries of the world are kept out or if some of the biggest uh, resource providers for the UN are kept out, that's not good for the organization. So we want that realization uh, really to grow. And I, you know, as someone who's seen this debate over many, many decades, I do feel today that uh, there, is a, there is a certain momentum uh, which, which has come about. Thank you very much. Any other questions? This person in the front, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. So my question is from the viewpoint of the QUET framework, and uh, I would like to know that is there any uh, nuclear strategic planning is planned under the QUET framework to address the Sorry, is there any? nuclear strategic planning for the power generation under the QUET framework to address the uh, climate change uh, through the energy or clean energy options? Thank you. Uh, the, you know, the Quad does discuss climate change. Uh, the Quad has discussed energy and technology issues. Uh, but uh, we have not had an explicit coordinated discussion on uh, nuclear energy per se. Uh, if you look at the Quad countries, uh, three of us, uh, Japan, US, India, we have very substantial uh, nuclear programs. Uh, uh, Australia, less so because of the, the situation. Uh, but they are very big uh, uranium uh, uh, providers. Uh, so we have a common interest in it. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, in the case of Quad, what I have seen since 2017, uh, we are actually moving very, very rapidly, almost at every Quad meeting. Every time the foreign ministers meet, every time the leaders meet, uh, more and more issues are getting added on. Uh, so, you know, maybe uh, next time we talk, I might have a different answer than I have right now. Thank you very much, Doctor. Your excellent speech. My name is Manish Gupta. I work for Mitsubishi Mahindra Agri Machinery in Japan. I've come here with my wife, Shalini. Uh, we would like to hear from you why Bharat matters. Uh, well, I can, you can hear from me, but it would be better if you actually got the book and read it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and, and the reason is, I have, I have a whole lot of reasons why, why Bharat matters. But if I, if, you know, fast forward you through the book, uh, I would say uh, why uh, Bharat matters today is uh, in many ways we've had a remarkable change in India in the last 10 years. Uh, it's a change that anybody who goes to India can see. Uh, you know, the infrastructure is changing, uh, the, the education levels uh, is changing, the economic progress is more visible. Uh, there is a certain buzz about innovation, about startups. So actually today it's a, it's a very, very optimistic, uh, you know, uh, uh, energetic 
society. But one which is very confident uh, about its own abilities. So uh, uh, the the sense of uh, both, you know, of what we can do has grown. But it's not only the present and the future. It's also about who we are, because you know it's very important for all societies to to uh, to appreciate their own culture, their own tradition, their own heritage. Uh, perhaps in the past, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, this may not have been uh, as uh, strongly done as it should have been done. So, I my my argument for why Bharat matters is uh, Bharat matters because uh, there is a sharper awareness of our own identity, uh, of our own past, of our civilizational heritage, which we can bring uh, to the international level. Bharat matters because along with tradition, uh, there is also a big technology contribution today uh, that India uh, can make, so it's both tradition uh, and technology. And Bharat matters because if I were to uh, go to your first question, uh, there is, you know, at a time when many countries are moving away from the world, they are, they are saying, I don't want to get involved, I don't want to, you know, why should I do that? Actually, India is doing more. That if you look at uh, our development projects, if you look at our first responder uh, operations, uh, if you look uh, even at the fact that we provided vaccines to 100 countries in the world, and we gave vaccines when we were still vaccinating our own people, we had not finished that. So the, there is a, today a, a mindset in India to, to grow more, to do more, but also do, do more with the world. But that is essentially why I think Bharat matters. Any other question? So a person sitting at the back, maybe? So in the middle, the third row, in the middle? Thank you, sir, for the wonderful uh, you know, uh, remarks. I'm Hemant. I'm an assistant professor in Shimane University, uh, which is a very small, uh, uh, very far from Tokyo. Uh, it's a very regional uh, part of Japan. So my question to you is, uh, we know that there's a very strong uh, strategic and uh, you know, friendship and uh, good relation between India and Japan, uh, almost in all spheres. But uh, most of the activities seem to happen between big cities of the two countries. So, given the demographic change uh, and population decline and so on, in Japan, where I live, I can see that uh, every day. So, what, what are your thoughts on how India and Indian diaspora uh, can contribute to regional revitalization in Japan? Thank you. Uh, no, thank you for bringing up that point. You know, I feel that today our political relationship between India and Japan is very strong. Uh, I also feel that uh, in a domain like defense and security, it has developed very well. But if there are two domains which hasn't moved at the same level as uh, uh, the political relationship, uh, one is the economic domain. Uh, we are not seeing our, our politics is much better, frankly, than our business. Business is not bad, but business should be growing very much faster uh, than, uh, than what it has done uh, today. Uh, and uh, I think the, uh, many of the new technologies uh, today offer us the chance uh, to, to do that. And, uh, and you know, Japan uh, has, a, has a long history in India. There are many areas where, you know, Japan, in, you know, there are areas where Japanese companies have been there uh, for more than 150 years uh, in India. Uh, the other which pertains to what you are saying is I feel the people-to-people -people linkages uh, is still uh, relatively limited. Uh, we have, you know, there are, as, as an example, uh, because you are from a university, uh, we have somewhere between 1.1 to 1.3 million students, Indian students out of India at any given time. I was told that the number of Indian students in Japan is about 1,500. Now, my math says that is 0.1% uh, of roughly of 
the Indian students abroad. So to me, these are examples of where we can actually, we should be doing more. We should be doing much more on language, uh, language teaching. Uh, so, uh, because language teaching is good for people to people relations, it's also good for business. And eventually it is good for a larger understanding between uh, India and Japan. It's good for politics as well. So, uh, there are areas we need to work hard. I, I think uh, anybody who can make any contribution, you certainly, you know, if you, if you are out of Tokyo, your contribution is even more important. Uh, I, I would urge you all, each few in your own way, uh, to find ways of, of contributing to that relationship. Hi, it's three people. So, thank you. Any other question? Mm -hmm. oh. Uh, please speak to the microphone for the interpretation's sake. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sojin Shin, Associate Professor at Tokyo International University. I'm from South Korea. Um, I have uh, three questions. Uh, the first question addresses uh, Indo uh, India's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, which emphasizes uh, um, free, open, and rules-based uh, in the Pacific strategy. But what is the, the strategic importance of this uh, India's uh, strategy uh, to Asian neighbors other than Japan? And second question is about Quad. Um, I'm wondering whether Quad dialogue can be extended to other Asian countries like South Korea or ASEAN community. Well, you mentioned about India is outlier. But uh, there are many other Asian countries which feel like outliers themselves, especially in the, the um, Quad dialogue, I guess. So um, I'm wondering about your thought. In the third question is about uh, Global South. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I think India's role as uh, the leader in Global South, uh, uh, making uh, the Global South community, their solidarity is very important, especially in terms of economic role. Um, when we look at the, the South Asian neighbors like Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka announced uh, economic uh, default in 2022. And I'm wondering whether India um, is uh, thinking of the role um, in the South Asian community or maybe further in Asia as uh, the leading economy, like as uh, the fifth largest economy. Thank you. Okay, uh, many questions, yeah. but uh, <laughs> no, no, you know. Uh, your first question, uh, does, does India value its ties, its relationship with other Asian countries? Uh, just so that you know, I'm coming to Tokyo from Seoul. I was in South Korea uh, for two days before I came here. Uh, and, uh, you know, we also have a very, very deep relationship with the ASEAN. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, for us, we associate that with the, what we call the reform period in India, uh, when we opened up our economy and did many more things. And we did that by dealing much more with other countries, other economies uh, in, uh, in Asia, ASEAN, uh, South Korea, Japan. So, so uh, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, for us, uh, you know, uh, we, many, many other partners in Asia uh, are very important, uh, and we uh, certainly want to take those relationships uh, forward as well. Uh, in fact, I gave a speech, by the way, in Korea about the importance of India-Korea relations. It's on the YouTube, so please take a look at it. Uh, the second, uh, you know, you spoke about uh, outliers, and your question can quad uh, include other countries. You know, first of all, if you add another country to a quad, it won't be called the quad uh, anymore. Uh, but the answer really is, you know, uh, the four of us have, uh, I mean, in some ways we are very dissimilar, but there are many things which bring us together. Uh, we are all four of us currently in the quad, very strong maritime powers. Uh, if you see in the Indo-Pacific, we are located at four corners almost, you can say, uh, of, of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you know, my own point, why did the Quad work in 2017? Uh, was in each case, our bilateral relationship had grown 
uh, very substantially. So in each case, for example, we have today two plus two uh, defense and foreign affairs uh, interaction as well. So it's it's not something you know which you you take a decision lightly. I mean, there were very good reasons why the four happened to be the four uh, uh, in question. Uh, so and uh, uh, on on the issue of global south. Uh, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is a very pertinent example, and I, I thank you for mentioning it. Uh, when Sri Lanka uh, got into economic difficulties, uh, and, you know, uh, in a way it comes to uh, the first issue we were discussing, that, uh, yes, there is a very, uh, you know, this conflict, there's this tragic conflict taking place in Ukraine, but if you look at the consequences of it for the global south, uh, everywhere in the global south, energy costs went up, food costs went up, fertilizer costs went up, inflation went up. And a country like Sri Lanka just had a, and, you know, everything came together and they had this huge economic crisis. Now, during this period, if you look to see which country stepped forward to help Sri Lanka, we in India uh, actually put together a package within a matter of a few weeks, in fact a few months. Uh, which was four and a half uh, billion dollars uh, in uh, to to Sri Lanka in grants and loans. Now, just so that you understand, the IMF package, which took much longer, was uh, less than three billion dollars. So, our direct bilateral support we gave to Sri Lanka was actually 50 percent larger than what the IMF gave, and more important, was given in time. It was given at a time when Sri Lanka was really struggling. So we do recognize today, uh, you know, that as a, as a big economy, uh, um, uh, you know, we have more responsibilities. But I also would like the world to recognize that we may be a big economy, but we are still an economy whose per capita income is below $3,000. So when we give something to the world, it is done with a great deal of sacrifice uh, and really a great effort on the part of people of India. I mean, their interna the sense of international obligation is very strong, as I said, during vaccination. That while we, we had not completed our vaccination, yet we gave vaccines. So we, we take our Global South responsibility very, very seriously. I think, I and apologies, um, if you can just keep your question to one per person. So this person at the far back, please. So my name is Gostab and I am a student in Japan. I'm a master's student in Nagoya. And everyone's been like throwing the word around Global South. And one thing common between all the countries in the Global South is we all want to, you know, shift to the Global North. Like all of our educated uh, individuals, all of the qualified individuals want to move to the Global North. So do you think there will be a time one day like when, India, when Indians will not want to move out, not want to have to move out and would love to like stay back in India and like you know as India is a devel developing economy, it's rapidly con uh, developing but the numbers are rising who want to like move abroad, who want to go work abroad. So do you think there will be a time in the future where you know this, these numbers will reduce? Uh, I'm just curious how long have you been studying in Japan? One and a half years. One and a half years. Uh, look, uh, my sense is that uh, there's already a big change happening. Because at the end of the day, uh, if I had an opportunity at home versus having an opportunity abroad, why would I move out of my own environment if I had that opportunity? So I, I look at the problem somewhat differently than you do. I mean, to me, it is a question of creating growth and opportunity in India. Uh, now, uh, to the extent that growth rates are faster, but also it's not just a growth rate. Along with that, uh, if employment opportunities are more, if there is a startup culture, you know, not everybody today wants a salaried job, not everybody wants to join the government. 
there are people, much of the attraction of people who go out sometimes is that they do their own thing. Now, if you can create a situation in India where, uh, where that is possible, I think uh, uh, the, the youth of India would have a, uh, a much more optimistic view of their own prospects in India. And that is one of the changes which is happening today. I mean, if you look today at the number of startups, I mean, we have uh, today the, uh, I think just in numbers terms, the third largest startups uh, in the world. You look at the number of unicorns which have come up in this period because they are inspirational examples for every other startup because somebody doing a startup sees a, hears of a unicorn, they feel, okay, I can also be uh, like that. Uh, I would also say, uh, you know, uh, when, when you see the expansion uh, of the economy in many more areas, in new, t you know, we, I, again, I give you a very, very contemporary example. Uh, till uh, we had one very small fab in India in Chandigarh. Uh, that was the only uh, facility of the kind which existed after 80 years. Uh, on the semiconductor side, we were importing everything. And yet, everybody will tell you this is the industry of the future. This is where the jobs will grow. Uh, we've had companies from abroad actually employ people in India, you know. So they are design engineers working for foreign semiconductor companies uh, located in India. Now, once we have taken the decision that no, we will also enter this field, uh, we will also set up foundries, we will also, uh, you know, uh, create the displays and the ATMPs for, uh, for operations, uh, you will see that, you know, anybody who has an interest in that field will now think, yes, I have an opportunity in India. So, a big part of the challenge which you have flagged is about doing well uh, in India. And, and to uh, uh, do that, uh, frankly, we need uh, today, you know, a leadership which has that kind of vision, uh, which has that ability to do it on the ground. Because sometimes people talk, but to promise something and in two or three or five years, to actually see the factory uh, out there. You know, last year, uh, Prime Minister went to, uh, to uh, the US. One of the uh, agreements which we, uh, we uh, sort of concluded uh, was with this company called Micron. Now, already the Micron, I mean, we are now talking six months, seven months. The Micron factory is coming up as we speak. So I think there is that big change in India which also you need to recognize and I'm sure it will be very good for people of your generation. So any other question? So on the left hand side, the fourth row from the front. Um, thank you so much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the Nikkei Forum for this opportunity. And sir, uh, it's an honor uh, to hear you in uh, person. My name is Devin, and uh, my question is somewhat relates to the uh, answer that uh, you know you were discussing uh, about the question uh, you know related to why Bharat matters, and also a couple of points related to uh, the last question. You know, as a part of uh, the Indian diaspora, uh, there are these tiny things that really matter when we go back to India, be it on a holiday, be it on a longer sort of, you know, couple of uh, weeks, four weeks. So when we see things changing in India, and as you rightly pointed out, I think the leadership has it in it right now, you know, to make these changes. Uh, and we have, I think, seen these changes happening in the last 10 years, especially. So when you interact with the diaspora, not just in Japan, but globally, are there any points that you consider which, you know, which are then inculcated in the policy making so that, you know, those reflect as tiny changes uh, that would eventually happen that we'll see uh, in the coming years? Thank you. Um, I mean, in a way, I don't know if I'm answering quite what you are asking. Uh, there are many things happening around the world uh, which for us it is uh, important to understand, appreciate and see if they can feed back 
into what's happening in India. Uh, this is not unusual. Uh, in fact, if you look at Japan's own history, uh, in the 19th century and a large part of the 20th century, actually, uh, Japan was very, very enthusiastic about identifying best practices in the world and uh, applying them to Japan and obviously, in many cases, modifying them uh, for, for Japanese conditions. Uh, I do believe today uh, that kind of mindset is there when it comes to policy making and governance uh, in India. I mean, I have myself seen uh, the impact which uh, different, uh, uh, you know, achievements in other countries uh, have, the influence that they've had uh, on, um, uh, on uh, sort of uh, decisions. Uh, this, you know, this could be on cleaning up rivers, it could be about, uh, you know, best practices in railways, uh, uh, it, it could be uh, tech stuff. Uh, so, uh, in my view, this often these little, little things uh, can accumulate it. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you know, a, a, a big problem, for example, we used to have uh, in infrastructure building was the time taken for service. Today, if you look at this program initiative we call Gati Shakti, so much of it is done between drones and satellites. It has dramatically crunched uh, the time. So, uh, this willingness to, to learn from, you know, others in the world, I think is a very important part of uh, uh, changing things in India. And uh, I mean, to, to those Indians who are living and working abroad, I think you particularly can make a contribution you know, you can make a contribution physically, but you can also make it in very ways by, by uh, sensitizing people or communicating to people back home. So we have many questions from the Indian national, and we would definitely like to hear from the Japanese national as well. My name is Shikata, a company fellow of Mitsubishi Company Limited. Let me ask you one thing about the Taiwan. Taiwan contingency is the Japan contingency, as late Prime Minister said. If it happens, I'm afraid China most likely coordinate with Russia or DPRK. In such a case, what will be India's response to such a contingency as a very important partner of Japan? Do you think India is ready to impose sanctions on China and on Russia, for example. Thank you very much. Um, um, you know, let me make uh, two, three observations here. By and large, it has not been India's foreign policy uh, method uh, really to, uh, to do this sanctions uh, issue, you know. The, the sanctions is uh, something which is very much rooted in a Western way or a, I would say a G7 way of working because uh, they control the, the means to, to apply the sanctions. In fact, I'm trying to think the only time when we have very strongly advocated sanctions ourselves uh, was against uh, South Africa during the apartheid uh, period when actually at that time uh, most of the developed countries did not want to do sanctions. Uh, if you look at even current sanctions, you know, sanctions, uh, how, it's, a, it's a big debate frankly in our business, do sanctions really work or they don't work, what is the cost, what is the cost to people who apply sanctions. So I just want to make that one point, it's nothing to do with Taiwan or China or Russia, as, as sanctions. Not every country in the world thinks that this is the immediate, right, uh, uh, effective way uh, of conveying what you uh, want to convey. Uh, regarding, you know, any contingency which happens, today, you know, the, the state of the world uh, is very disturbed. You know, the state of the world is very disturbed. We are seeing conflicts. As I said, we saw COVID. Uh, there are very big economic uh, issues which are below the surface, you know. 
Uh, and if one travels, uh, especially, again, I'm coming back to Global South. Uh, if, when you physically go there and see what a, what a toll it has taken the last few years on them, you know, how much uh, today the spending on education, on health, on public, uh, all of this has come down. So the last thing that the world needs to see is any kind of disturbance. You know, uh, you know at this moment, how to, how to uh, strengthen the stability and the uh, growth and the development of the world should actually be a, a common objective. Beyond that, I think as a foreign minister, I should not say anything to you. So now it is uh, coming to a time to close, but uh, we'd like to also have one last question uh, from a uh, Japanese person, maybe, uh, sitting on the side. Hello. A professor from Kenda University. Uh, my question is about the uh, uh, coming general election. The result of the uh, election will affect the Indian diplomacy as uh, uh, it is likely that you will have the uh, long-term government, uh, maybe a 15 years long-term government can uh, pursue the uh, uh, stable uh, negotiation with other countries. So uh, could you answer this question? Uh, sorry. Uh, I, I didn't fully understand that. Your point was that we have a stable government? So uh, you will have the, uh, f maybe uh, you will have the 15 years uh, stable government. 100 percent. We'll have 15 years. <laughs> uh, we, we may have even longer. <laughs> okay, okay, hi. But it could be the 20 years. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, so could you answer the uh, question, please? You know, um, it's, again, I want to first begin by saying every country, every society is different. So what can apply to India need not always be uh, the same for, uh, for other countries. But our own experience uh, was that uh, the uh, lack of stability in politics, uh, which really meant you know, uh, to have majorities in parliament to take decisions, to take bold steps. It makes a very, very big difference. Uh, uh, when I look, and, and you know, I'm, I've, I've been in government, frankly, a very long time. I've seen many, many governments. I've seen majority governments. I've seen uh, minority governments. I've seen coalition governments. I've seen single party governments. Uh, you can see uh, today that uh, if you have actually a reformist, you know, uh, a leadership with a vision, with a commitment, uh, with a sense of wanting to do things. But that leadership is backed by uh, a very strong political mandate. And a strong political mandate, ideally, in democracies, means uh, uh, having a majority in parliament. Uh, that is really what is the combination you need because you can have a you know you can have a majority but you don't have a vision or you have a vision but you don't have the political support so you need both now what has happened in our cases uh, certainly for the last 10 years we've had both and we hope to continue that uh, so uh, you know uh, in ma in many cases we have seen d decisions which were debated for years but suddenly you found the ability to do it. You know, uh, one good example for us, for example, was a sort of a national, uh, you know, tax system. Because our tax, you know, because it was so regional, it was, it was very complicated. And not, frankly, not even very efficient, you know. Uh, or uh, I would say, you know, we, we had some very uh, long-standing issues regarding uh, integration of one of our states. So we have been able to take uh, good decisions, you know, tough decisions, but needed decisions. Once you have both that leadership and that mandate, and that means long-term uh, stability. And I, I would even say, uh, you know, as, as someone with, who has a little bit of insight into the business world, 
the business world today very much values uh, political stability because for them political stability means policy stability anybody who is coming you know somebody who is taking a big bet on india they want to know okay what will india be for the next 10 years now if you if their sense is you know i don't even know what it will be like a year from now or 6 months from now uh, the the investor i mean could be a domestic investor could be a foreign investor they will hesitate so uh, i i can you know when when you do a kind of a country evaluation a risk evaluation or a, uh, i think political stability is a very important uh, part of that and uh, fortunately that's been good for us uh, for the last decade and i'm very confident for the next one so minister let me ask you one more short question right so uh, we know you as an incumbent senator uh upper house of india right but however uh, some news report said you might run for uh, the mp uh, in the coming general election so are you really preparing for that you know uh, i didn't expect that question here <laughs> uh, and that too from you yeah uh, so uh, uh, what what happens is uh, typically uh, i mean uh, we you you make your political decision based on frankly what the party party leadership uh, uh, decides so i have just got reelected to the upper house last year uh, for us it's a six year term uh, so uh, so uh, my membership of parliament is secure be, be, beyond that you know uh, that is not really a question i can answer <laughs> thanks very much はい、どうもありがとうございました。えっ、ー、と、じゃあ、あのー。It is time, is that we would like to conclude today's forum. We should give a round of applause、uh, to、uh, the minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. Jai Shankar, Gai Mu Daijin, ありがとう Thank you very much, Mr. Jai Shankar. Would you give a round of applause to the minister again? With that, we